You have repeatedly said that you see many wonderful stock ideas, but can't invest because they're too small. Given that many in the audience today have a lower dollar investment threshold. <laughs> Do these stocks have names? <laughs> yeah. Well said. Well, the answer to that is that we don't look anymore. It, uh, we, we assume that there are a reasonable number of opportunities as you work with smaller amounts of capital because it's always been true. I mean, it was over the years as I looked at things, uh, clearly you run into companies that are less followed as you get smaller and, and there's more chances for inefficiency when you're dealing with something where you can buy $100,000 worth of it in a month rather than $100 million. But that is not because I'm carrying around in my head the names of 25 companies that we could put 100,000 in. And I just don't look at that at that universe anymore. I sometimes people send me annual reports or I uh, get letters from managers and they they say, "Won't well, you know, I've got this wonderful thing." And I look. I I usually know ahead of time, but I mean, I would first look at the size, and if the size isn't isn't right and it isn't going to be virtually any time, I don't I don't look any further because the there's just no time to be looking at at uh, at all kinds of smaller opportunities. I do think I do think if you're working with very small amounts of money that uh, that there almost always are some significant inefficiency someplace uh, uh, to find things that uh, I've mentioned to some people. When I started out, I actually went through the all of the Moody's manuals and the Standard Poor's manuals page by page, and you could and uh, you know it's, it's probably twenty thousand pages, but but. Uh, uh, there were a lot of things that popped out, and none of them were in any brokerage report or anything of the sort. They were just plain overlooked, and you had to, you could, you could find out about them, but nobody was going to tell you about them. Uh, and my guess is that that continues to be true, but not on anything like the scale it was then. Charlie, well, I can remember when you bought one membership in some duck club that had oil in under it when you were young. Yeah, there was a company uh, called I mean, Atlas. When you get down to one Duck Club membership, well, you're really scavenging for cigar butts. <laughs> but uh, not a bad cigar butt. There were 98 shares outstanding. It was the Delta Duck Club, and the the Delta Duck Club was founded by 100 guys who put in 50 bucks each, except two fellows didn't pay. So there were only 98 shares outstanding. They bought a piece of land down in Louisiana and. One time somebody shot downward instead of upward and oil and gas started spewing forth out of the ground. <laughs> so they renamed it Atlet, which is Delta spelled backwards, which was sort of illustrated the sophistication of this group. And, <laughs> and a few years later, they were taking, at $3 a barrel oil, they were taking about a million dollars a year in royalties out of the uh, place. And the stock was selling at $29,000 a share and it was earning $10,000 a share. No, it was earning about was earning about $7,000 a share after tax, about 11,000 pre-tax, and it had about 20,000 a share in cash. And it was a long-lived field. So, you know, I use that sometimes as an example of efficient markets because somebody called me and offered me a share of it. And uh, uh, those things, you know, is, is, is that an efficient market or not? You know, 29,000 for 20,000 of cash plus Eleven thousand of royalty income at twenty-five cent gas and three dollar oil. I don't think so. That uh, uh, you can find things out there. That, uh, I'll give you hunting rights on all my duck clubs in the future. Uh, <laughs> well, I would use the approach that I think I'm using now of trying to search out businesses that where I think they're selling at the lowest price relative to the discounted cash they would produce in the future. But if I were working with a small amount of money, the universe would be huge compared to the universe of possible ideas I work with now. You mentioned that 56 to 69 was the best period. Actually, my best period was before that. It was from right after I met Ben Graham in 19, early 1951. But from the end of 1950 through the next 10 years, actually returns averaged about 50% a year. And they, I think they were 37 points better than the Dow per year, something like that. But that I was working with a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of money. And so I would pour through volumes of, of, of businesses and I would find one or two that I could put $10,000 into or $15,000 into that 
was just ridic were, they were ridiculously cheap. And obviously, as the money increased, uh, the, the universe of possible ideas started shrinking dramatically. The times were also better for doing it in that time. But I, I think that, I think if you're working with a small amount of money, with exactly the same background that Charlie and I have, and same ideas, same, same whatever ability we have, you know, I think you can make very significant sums. But you, but as soon as you start getting the money up into the millions, many millions, the 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 curve on expectable results falls off just dramatically. Uh, but that's that's the nature of it. it you've got a you know when you've. When you get up to things you can put millions of dollars into, you've got a lot of competition looking at that, and they're not looking as I did when I started. When I started, I went through the pages of the manuals page by page. I mean, I probably went through 20,000 pages uh, in the Moody's Industrial Transportation Banks and Finance manuals, and I did it twice. And I actually you know, looked at every business. I didn't look very hard at some. Well, that's not a practical way to invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so I would say if you're working with a small sum of money uh, that, and you're really interested in, in, the, in the business and willing to do the work, you, can, you will find something. If you were, I, you, there's no question about it in my mind. You will find some things that promise very large returns compared to what we will be able to uh, uh, deliver uh, with large sums of money. Charlie? Well, yeah, I think that's right. A, a brilliant man who can't get any money from other people and is working with a very small sum probably should work in very obscure stocks, searching out uh, unusual mispriced opportunities. But, you know, you could... That's such a small world. It may be a way for one person to come up, but it's a... It's a long slog. Yeah, most smart people, unfortunately, in Wall Street figure that they can make a lot more money, a lot easier, just by uh, one way or another, you know, uh, getting an override on other people's money or, or, or uh, uh, delivering services in some way that people... Um, and the monetization of hope and greed, you know, is a way to make a huge amount of money. Uh, and right now, it's very, uh, just take hedge funds. I mean, it's, I, I've had calls from a couple of friends in the last month that don't know anything about that investing money. They've been unsuccessful and everything else. And, you know, one of them called me the other day and said, well, I'm forming a small hedge fund, 125 million, he was talking about. And, you know, like the thought that since it was only 125 million, maybe we ought to put in 10 million or something of the sort. I mean, if you looked at this fellow's Schedule D on his 1040, for the last 20 years, you know, you'd think he ought to be mowing lawns, but yeah. but he may get his 125 million. I mean, you know, and it's it's just astounding to me how willing people are during a bull market just to just to toss money around because they you know they think it's easy and and of course that's that's what they felt, felt about internet stocks a few years ago. They'll think about something else next year too. But uh, the the biggest money made, you know, in, in Wall Street in recent years, has not been made by great performance, but it's been by, by been made by great promotion, basically. Charlie, do you have anything? Well, I would state it even more strongly. I, I think uh, the the current scene is obscene. I think there's too much mania, there's too much chasing after easy money, there's too much uh, misleading sales material about investments, uh, there's too much on the television uh, emphasizing speculation in stocks. <laughs>